It takes a lot of energy to get yourself or anything else into space. Five, four, three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of NASA's New Horizons spacecraft on a decade-long voyage to visit the planet Pluto and then beyond. The Atlas V rocket that sent the New Horizons probe to Pluto and beyond has the equivalent of nearly a million horsepower. To put something into orbit, whether it's a satellite or a human, costs about $10,000 per pound. There is simply no such thing as a free launch. So why spend all the time, money, and resources to going up when there are plenty of things to do down here? I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology, and in this episode, making the case for space, whether we send our satellites, our robots, or ourselves. NASA, the world's biggest space agency, has done all that. Russia, China, India, Japan, and the Europeans have also sent up hardware or humans. But now more than a dozen emerging nations want access to space as well. Find out which ones and why going into space helps life on the ground. Also, the launch of a new satellite produces weather photos in high def, and a tour of the solar system reminds us that our species thrives on exploration. This episode, Space, Why Go There? Your to-do list this week might have a hundred items on it. Imagine the to-do list for humanity. There are plenty of problems to be solved right here on Earth. So why are we bothering with this? Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past... It's a valid question. It's a good question. Um, but no one ever questions, for example, the value of a, a Picasso. It's always space. I'm not sure that the value of a Picasso painting is never questioned. One of his 1932 paintings went for a record 106.5 million bucks, making it the most expensive canvas ever sold. That's a lot of green for some blobs of colored oil. Can we even trust this woman's objectiveness? After all, our space efforts give her job security. I'm Sarah Crittis, and I'm a space journalist, broadcaster, and author. But she does make a good point. The American space program is only one half of one percent of the federal budget. But economics aside, people still ask, what has space ever done for me? We are living in a world shaped by the space age. It has created excitement, new knowledge, and real practical benefits. For many space buffs, it's simply our destiny to make us a spacefaring species. But if that doesn't appeal to you, okay, consider the practical benefits. Pretty much all of us have one of these, which I'm holding in my hand, which is a, a space receiver. It's not a mobile phone or a smartphone. It's a space receiver. We're living in a space age, which is not only transforming life for all of us on Earth, not including just the wealthy, but those who are living in the developing world, where transactions are being transformed by the mobile phone, where farming's being transformed by the mobile phone. It's not so much about exploring for exploring's sake. It's also about improving life for but, all but, of us and wait, looking wait back at Earth. Are, are you saying that my cell phone wouldn't work if we didn't go into space? I mean, the cell phone's talking to a tower down the block here. Right. But your GPS on this? Well, yeah, but so what? I, I don't need to know where I am when I'm talking <laughs> to somebody. But a lot of people, they need it for their Uber and they need it for their Uber Eats and, and many other apps that they use. Uh, and we just, we're so reliant on space exploration, but we don't actually realize it. And also it's... And innate, you know, as humans, we're built to go over the hill, we're built to explore, we're built to wonder what else is out there. And we are lucky enough to be living in a time where space is that next hill. Oh, but you, you know, you sound like a space enthusiast. Maybe I'm jumping to conclusions here. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying is, okay, there are practical applications of having satellites around the Earth. But it, I, what are the practical applications of having those rovers on Mars? Being static is not good as a species. We're not meant to stay still. And why would we not want to know what was out there? Why would we not want to push that boundary? Why, you know, as a species, we've explored, you know, barring the oceans, which I think we should absolutely explore. We've explored our own planet and space is that next hill. So furthering our knowledge is going to benefit life here on Earth. The technology that we develop and the science and the research we do will eventually be used for technology to benefit all of us on Earth. And how can we 
live in this one planet in this one average solar system which is in one galaxy which is well many galaxies out there in the universe and not want to push beyond our own planet well you're saying we do it because how could we not want to do it but I, I don't know that you know that are you might... not pro space sir of course I, <laughs> of course I am and it goes with, goes without saying that's why I probably haven't said it but on the other hand let me give an example I like to read books about exploration and 200 years ago, the British Admiralty was sending Jim Cook into the South Pacific and telling him to, you know, go map everything you find and write down some stuff, and we'll even send along a biologist with you or whatever it was, a naturalist, you know. And you could say that was just about exploration. And it but cost- look what came out of it. Well, exactly. It was enormously important for the future of, of course, Britain, but also the world. But on the other hand, they kind of knew that that was going to be the case because if they didn't do it, maybe the French would do it, or or the Dutch, or the the Portuguese. So you know there was there were national interests here. It's sort but that's of like, exactly what's happening with space. It's national interests, it's government interests, and it's also business interests, because we're we're on this cusp for a new era where you know you could say Apollo was the Columbus moment. We're now in the Mayflower moment of space exploration. You've got opportunities to mine asteroids, to develop businesses, to use data which comes from looking back at Earth to create wealth and it's a new frontier and if you're not going to do it someone else is going to do it well maybe it comes down to that it's just self-preservation you know it's it's a combination of things but i think what's happening in space is no different to actually what we've done throughout our own like existence on earth we've explored we've developed we've lived off the land we're now doing that in space in terms of you know looking into space mining and all that kind of stuff which is happening it's it's no different to what we've done on earth it's just a new frontier it's the new wild west and that's why in many ways it's not unique and special and it's why wouldn't we go into space because it's the next natural step okay fine i buy that but you can say all the benefits we're going to get down the road from doing this from this exploration initiative but why not have you know private organizations fund that why do i have to be compelled when i pay my taxes to support that you know, well, in England, we don't have as big a space program as our in well, America. Wait a minute, don't back down. Just, you mean Robert Scott. It's those Americans who pay for it. Well, that's a good strategy, I have to say. But, you know, you know Robert Scott, what, 1910, 1911? Yeah. He tries to go to the South Pole, but he's not funded by the British government. No. Right? So it's all private. Why can't we do that? I think we're seeing that right now with space in terms of especially what Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are doing and then companies such as Planetary Resources with, and, and then look at Beam on the International Space Station the first private habitat in space now, even if it is just being tested, it is, it's becoming less and less about governments and more about private industry. And as soon as there's a way to make money out of space exploration, more and more people are going to do it, which is going to bring loads of technological benefits, loads of jobs, and it doesn't cost you anything. All right. So uh, do you see that happening? Are you going, I see that happening. Are, are you counting on being a tourist into space? I would love to go, and I think the more people you send into space, the more perspective. But I I don't think it should be about sending people... Yes, we need to have people who love space going into space, but also people who don't like space should go into space. Once we've evolved to the point that more and more people can go into space, because you think when you look at the moon landings, I mean, Jim Irwin came back a priest. You know, 12 humans walked on the surface of the moon, and they all came back changed people. Imagine what would happen when you sent an artist into space or a woman from a village in India and how that would change their perspective about Earth and the way they communicate with their peers. So I think, of course I'd love to go, but I think helping to send other people from all walks of life and making space accessible for all people on our planet is just as important as space enthusiasts who might in the future have the money to pay to go into space, going into space. Uh, You would like to democratize access (laughs) to space. I think Uh, so. Well, that that sounds admirable. Uh, What about survival? I mean, what if we don't go into space. I think Stephen Hawking has said that uh, if we don't go into space, you know, that's it. I mean, we we have a short uh, life expectancy as a species. He's probably right, but I don't buy the argument that we have to move to Mars as a backup for Earth. I think more the stuff that Jeff Bezos is looking into in terms of, you know, Earth is the best planet. Let's be honest, it's it's got everything we need, but moving things such as manufacturing into orbit, for example, so looking after planet Earth by utilising what we can in space and moving manufacturing and other skills into space in order to protect planet Earth is more of a viable option than sending a load of humans to Mars and having a Mars colony, in my opinion. But I think there's we constantly evolve, so space is the next thing. Yeah, well, I can certainly understand that, you know, mining asteroids, I mean, it sounds like a way to make money, and I hope it is. But but... also intergalactic petrol stations, they are, effectively. Oh, is that Douglas Adams? What is that? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> okay, okay, but but you know beyond that, that, that's in the next hundred years that we we've got to find a new supply of I don't know zinc or copper or platinum or something, and the asteroids. Well, you've got the the ingredients for rocket fuel in asteroids in the moon, though you've got water, so you've got hydrogen oxygen. Well, that so allows you, you to go to an asteroid and have the fuel to go to another asteroid, or go further into. The <laughs> well, you fill up on the way, don't you? But to go further into our solar system at lower cost. Yes. So okay. you launch with less fuel, you fill up on the way at an asteroid, you then go further into the solar system. It's too bad system. that we don't have asteroids all the way to the next star. <laughs> Maybe we can position them. Yes, <laughs> preposition them. Yes, food depots. Okay, so looking at the long-term future. Now, forget the next 100 years. We've, we've talked about that. But if you look 1,000 years into the future, what do you see? Is it, uh, you know, I don't know, like Star Wars? What's it like? I think there's a um, JBS Haldane quote, the universe is not only as strange as you can imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. So anything ridiculous I was to predict for a thousand years wouldn't be as strange enough, wouldn't be as ridiculous enough. So I don't think we can even begin to imagine because you take the last 100 years, approximately a human lifetime, and you look at what's happened. If you were born in 1900, you've seen flight, you've seen the crossing of the Atlantic, you've seen humans in space, humans landing on the moon, you've seen all of this just in one human lifetime and as the onset of technology just exponentially grows we can't even begin to imagine well, it sounds like you're dodging the question i'm I not mean, dodging the question well, you this, are. is I'm this a political interview no. <laughs> <laughs> well but partly i suppose but i mean really uh, the long-term future is it that you know we, we all don spandex outfits and boldly go or is it that we just have a uh, a better lifestyle on Earth by somehow controlling the population and miniaturizing everything so we don't use a lot of resources? I mean, what, where are we going? That is a good question. I don't know. Do you know? I don't think anyone knows. No, but that's why we're interviewing <laughs> you. <laughs> okay. Can we turn the tables now? Where do you think we're going? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I agree that there's no way to really predict anything. <laughs> there you, we go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all you have to do is look at the predictions from the 1920s and 30s of where we would be now, right? But what I would say is science fiction should be renamed science prediction because eventually all the things we imagine, as long as they don't break the fundamental laws of physics, eventually come true. So if you can imagine it, it, it can eventually happen. Yes, well, that sounds... Although, I, I, I have to say, interstellar travel, I'll put that to you. What about it? Yes. <laughs> okay, you see you see it coming down the pipe, do you? <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> All, right. All right. Sarah Crudis, thank you so much for talking with us. You're welcome. Sarah Crudis is a space journalist, broadcaster, and author based in the U.K. <laughs> Coming up, a high-definition look at a practical benefit of going into space as NASA launches a new weather satellite. Also, space access is a component of social justice. It's space. Why go there? On Big Picture Science. Hey, want to join me next summer for a one-week tour of southern France, including this spectacular Pic de Midi Observatory high in the Pyrenees? This is quite an expedition, including Paleolithic caves, spectacular cathedrals, and, of course, the very best food. And you can ask me all those embarrassing questions that have been percolating in your mind for years. Find out more. Go to melitatrips.com. That's Melita, M-E-L-I-T-A, Trips.com and uh, au revoir. Your definition of space depends on whom you ask. For space scientists and astronauts, space begins at 100 kilometers, at 62 miles, above sea level. There, Earth's atmosphere becomes vanishingly thin and the sky is black. The International Space Station, and many satellites for that matter, are in low Earth orbit at an altitude of between 160 and 2,000 kilometers. Uh, that's roughly 100 to 1,200 miles. But some orbiting satellites are much higher, and for good reason. They are unique and invaluable eyes in the sky. Geosynchronous orbit can be ideal for weather forecasting. Being geosynchronous means that it's actually orbiting at the same speed as the Earth. A satellite in geosynchronous orbit goes around the Earth in the same time it takes for the planet to rotate, 24 hours. They are synchronized. 
geostationary is a special case of geosynchronous orbit, one that's above the Earth's equator. So to the observer, the satellite appears to remain in one spot day and night. What's particular about the equator that produces that effect? Well, imagine drawing a line from the satellite above the equator down to the center of the Earth. Maybe it goes through Quito, Ecuador, who knows what. But it stays going through Quito, Ecuador. It's always above Quito, Ecuador. And if you had it going in some angle to the equator, well, that string connecting the satellite with the center of the Earth would start moving north through the North Atlantic and then come back down and then move back up and come back down. This way, it's fixed in the sky. It's like a bird on a very high phone pole. From its point of view, it's always looking down at the same region of the Earth, and that makes it great for tracking storms and other weather phenomena. In March 2017, NASA launched the latest GOES weather satellite. GOES stands for Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite. So the geostationary orbit for us is having the satellite parked in a position that is approximately 22,000 miles above the Earth. And being in that position, the satellite is rotating at the same speed as the Earth. So we're getting to see the high-definition imagery from a particular location. Jamie Sims is a physical scientist at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is operating the GOES satellites. Newly launched Goes West joins its twin, Goes East, launched a year earlier. So together they cover the Western Hemisphere. We're looking to cover not only the United States, we'll also have coverage as far west as New Zealand and as far east as the west coast of Africa. And we also look to cover from Alaska all the way down to South America as well. Dr. Sims says that the high-definition satellites work in tandem to track storms, wildfires, even lightning strikes. The advantage of a geostationary satellite is that, number one, we're actually able to get near real-time data. And if we have, you know, several severe storms going on and we need to really zone in to a particular area, we can overlay domains and actually get uh, 30-second scans. So we're able to monitor it and provide more information to our forecasters that actually do the predictions and forecasts of the storms. Well, you get real-time data because it's essentially staying in one spot relative to that storm, so it's always looking at it. You don't have to wait for the satellite to go around the Earth and come back and look at it again, right? Exactly, exactly. So on March 1st, we had the launch of Goes West. Sounds like something Horace Greeley might have said. Goes West, and that joins Goes East. So we have two satellites. Why, Why do you need two? I mean, you know, the weather system is the weather system. That is true, but what this does is allows us to detect and monitor the origin of storms. For example, during hurricane season, the hurricanes actually form typically off of the west coast of Africa and then strengthen as they come across the Atlantic. So that's the advantage of having that coverage on the east. And then on the west, you know, for the United States, the weather patterns actually travel from west to east. And if we're able to better monitor the weather in the Pacific that is actually heading towards the United States, then that should offer us more lead time. I think that uh, from a naive standpoint, the big advantage of observing the weather from a satellite as opposed to observing it from the ground is that you can monitor the oceans and they cover two-thirds of the planet and a lot of the weather really comes from the oceans, right? Exactly. You know, even the atmospheric rivers, as we refer to them, and this is the large column of moist air that can dump large amounts of snow or rain. You know, those basically originate out in the Pacific. Now, aboard Goes West is an instrument called the Advanced Baseline Imager. Uh, Sounds like a fancy name for a camera with very high resolution. I mean, these satellites have great cameras, but on the other hand, they're 22,000 miles up. You know, what, what's kind of the smallest thing you can see with uh, Goes West? With the Goes West satellite, we'll be able to see great detail of the storm systems as well as our everyday weather patterns. You know, for example, during Hurricane Harvey in particular, we were able to 
work with emergency managers to let them know when the eye of the hurricane was passing through Corpus Christi in order for them to evacuate approximately 200 people. We're also able to detect wildfires when they're forming. We were able to alert emergency managers and first responders to wildfire events that were occurring even before they received the first 911 call. So even though it is out 22,000 feet, because of this advanced imagery and advanced spectral channels, we're able to get, you know, many more levels within the atmosphere. So, okay, they're making these high-resolution photos of cloud cover, or, uh, presumably dust and other things. Um, what other sorts of sensors does the satellite have? Is it doing anything other than, if you will, photography? Yes. So we actually have six instruments on the satellite. As you mentioned, we have the advanced baseline imager, which is the one that is pretty much giving us our weather information. Then we have the geostationary lightning mapper, which is extremely exciting because this is the first lightning mapper to be on a geostationary satellite. And so with that, we are able to detect total lightning, which is cloud-to-cloud as well as cloud-to-ground lightning, and we receive it at 500 frames per second. And the lightning can give us information on the formulation as well as the dissipation of storms. Additionally, we have four instruments that are used for space weather and solar monitoring. Finally, Jimmy's, I suspect that if you tell somebody who's sitting next to you uh, in the train or on a plane or something, that uh, <laughs> this is the work you do, and they probably will complain to you about the fact that weather forecasts can be inaccurate. But honestly, they're a lot better than they were 20 years ago or 30 years ago before we had these satellites, aren't they? Most definitely. You know, I actually um, did an internship at the Hurricane Research Division with Dr. Chris Lancy where I studied the 1926 great Miami hurricane and that entire season. And I can remember even back then saying to myself, wow, you know, we've just advanced technology, of course, so much since then. Just going back to the extreme weather events that we've had over this past year, even though those storms were very major storms, we didn't have nearly as much of the loss of life as we would have several years back with the impact of these storms. So we are definitely advancing in our technology. Jimmy Sims, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Jimmy Sims is a physical scientist at NOAA with the GOES program. Well, satellites are invaluable for weather monitoring and forecasting, but satellites can also track the effects of climate change and the spread of disease. And how would you find that new fusion restaurant without the timing and location services provided by your GPS? That is a benefit of satellites, too. Well, the rewards of going into space are many, but not all countries benefit equally. There's certainly a distribution where it's more countries that have been more advanced and more involved with advanced technology that have benefited mainly. Danielle Wood is director of MIT Media Lab's Space Enabled Research Group. Her background includes satellite design, systems engineering, and technology policy for the U.S. and emerging nations. And she says that every country uses satellite services in some way. I do think in many cases we want to see better affordability for these services. For example, around the world in areas that do not yet have excellent uh, cell phone-based communication service, the price can be too high, and those who need the service the most can't afford it. It's impossible to have sustainable development in Earth-based systems without access to space technology, says Dr. Wood. And increasingly, that means that countries have their own satellites. Her team at MIT says that helping emerging nations get into space is a way to promote social justice. What you're seeing right now is a trend where more and more countries and actually commercial organizations are pursuing having their own satellites for different purposes. They often have particular questions they're trying to answer, such as in Thailand, they're interested in understanding what is going to be their annual crop yield. And they can, of course, use some of the data that's provided by international partners, other governments or companies, but they would also like to be able to confirm that they're going to have uh, the information they need when they need it for their own national decision making. I interviewed a team in Nairobi, Kenya, and they had used uh, a certain set of NASA data for decades and really appreciated that data. But of course, at some point, NASA stopped creating that data source, and NASA had no responsibility to the team in Kenya to continue to provide that data. So if the Kenyan team would like to have that data in the future, they have to decide how to get it for themselves. I think we can all picture how satellite data might be used to track land use or pollution but something like a disease or an invasive species, how do you do that? Satellites help us observe 
key features of the environment that affect how mosquitoes behave, for example. Mosquitoes like places that are moist and warm, and you can often tell that there's been more rain recently, and you understand how the elevation of the land makes the water pool in certain areas, and you understand how uh, the soil might be a certain moisture and the humidity of the air might be a certain level. That's going to lead to more mosquito activity. If you know that, you also want to ask where people are living and say, are people living nearby? Are they going to be exposed to these mosquitoes? And further, has anyone had malaria in that area recently? So you need population data, medical data. If you can find all that into a model, you can ask, is that certain region going to have a high risk of malaria outbreaks? And if so, can we spread more bed nets and more spray in that area right now to help reduce the likelihood of malaria spreading? You know, NASA has been around for 60 years in just the form of NASA. If you look at its original form, it really started in 1915. That's almost a 100-year head start on some of these other space agencies. So what does it mean to start a space agency from scratch? Can you give us a list of some of the, the countries that are interested in developing a satellite technology or that have new space programs? Certainly. So there are over 60 countries that have some kind of national office or agency focused on leading their space activity. Now, you do see a trend where many of them choose as a first activity to buy or build an Earth observation satellite to help monitor the environment. If you think about the countries near the equator, many of them face a lot of national disasters in zones either that face earthquakes or floods or typhoons regularly. So it's very important that they understand their environment. So in Africa alone, the leading countries that are involved with space include Nigeria, South Africa, Morocco, Egypt. All of those have formal agencies and also Algeria as well. Then you have countries such as Kenya and Ghana that are in the process of creating new space activities and have either new agencies or new institutes at the government level. Now, Nigeria, Algeria, Egypt, South Africa, Morocco have all completed satellite projects. And more recently, Ghana has had their first satellite go into space. It was built by a team of university students that uh, were based in Japan, but they were uh, sent by their country to be the first key satellite engineers working directly for the goal of the country. And in Kenya, for example, their first national satellite also is being built in collaboration with Italy. It'll be launched from the space station uh, as a small, what's called a CubeSat, uh, that is going to be the first Kenyan satellite. Now, you named some of the countries that have new space agenda, and I think you named many countries just in, in Africa, but you have been studying those countries that are interested in South America, but also in Asia as well. So I wonder if we could finish that list of, of some of the countries that are, are the ones to watch. That's great. Yeah, it's definitely good to understand globally that you're seeing more and more countries get involved with space. The countries of Brazil and Argentina have been very involved with having national space programs for decades. And Brazil has a capability already to build advanced satellites locally, and they're working toward having launch capabilities. They've done some tests and had some accidents, but they're continuing to work on that area. Argentina is also very experienced. Some of the newer countries that are involved include Mexico. Costa Rica is going to have their first uh, university-driven small satellite in the future. Uh, we have also activities in Venezuela, which is partnered closely with China. So you're really seeing many countries that see space as part of their national agenda in some form. It's almost be shorter if you just gave us a list of the countries that aren't getting involved in space, but, but continue. Okay, Southeast sure. Asia. Yeah, there's definitely countries that have clear priorities. So in Southeast Asia, you see uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and Singapore all have very formal activities and multiple satellite projects that they've launched. I want to give the example of Malaysia. They formed a space agency about a decade ago, and they included their uh, activities both building satellites and creating more space science education, but they also had an astronaut program. In this case, they selected an astronaut from Malaysia and worked with Russia and their space equipment program to send them to the space station. And it was the first time to have a person practicing Islam go to space and make an effort to focus on finding ways to keep their traditions while in space. So they had to ask a team to say, Let, let's define how this person will pray and follow the traditions of their religion while they're on space station. And they came up with a plan and were able to follow their traditions while they were in space. In the Middle East, um, the UAE is definitely a country to watch. They have committed to sending a satellite to Mars to actually enter orbit around Mars, which would be a very great feat. Only a few countries, including the US and Europe and India, have done this before. And they are also looking for ways to include more space research in their desert, actually. They're going to create a city in the desert outside Dubai that will represent a place to simulate future Mars missions. We can also add Turkey to the list. It's had a number of satellite missions. It's really quite an active area. Okay, we're talking about space. Our, our heads are in space right now. Perhaps we're all picturing it. 
But coming back down to earth for a moment, so Danielle, you're in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's where you are. You're here on earth. And what is it that you can do in the MIT Media Lab to help ensure that access to space is truly democratic? So our goal is to become partners that do co-design with communities. So ultimately, we don't want to be a team that says, hey, we have space technology, you need this. Because that would be an unhelpful philosophy as a way to think about advancing justice with our technology. (laughs) What we would like to do, uh, and what we are doing, is identifying partners, including national governments and entrepreneurs who represent communities all over the world, especially in places like Africa and Latin America. They come to us and tell us which sustainable development goal they're working on. We would then ask, how can we use social science tools to first understand what's the history of the situation? What's happened just on a human-to-human scale, either in economic or political systems that's created some of these challenges? I think it's always clear that if you have a challenge such as illegal mining or the ravages of an invasive species, it's because there's been some breakdown in political or social systems. So we'll first try to understand that on a social point of view. Next, we're going to build computer models to help us and the community members discuss what might be possible ways to design technology to address this topic. We're there to help them figure out how to use the technology and help spur new ideas, but they're the ones who are going to lead the change in their own communities. Danielle Wood, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Danielle Wood is director of the MIT Media Lab Space Enabled Research Group. Well, it sounds like she and her team at MIT are working to make space for everyone, literally. Yeah, yes, they are. Well, of course, I mean, there's the benefit. There's the benefit to these countries where, for example, a lot of space services, you know, like the Internet, for example, can be very expensive. And if you have better access to that, your economy is better. If your economy is better, the situation in the world is better, not to mention the lives of the people who live in these places. There was a time when just two countries had gone into space. Yes, In fact, there was a time when only one country had gone into space, and I remember that. Okay, and there was a time before that when no country had gone into space. But that was a very long period of time, yes. (laughs) Okay, and now we're talking about dozens of countries, perhaps. I'm looking forward to that. I think it'll be good. We'll have the Space Federation here. Clearly, sending satellites into space has manifold practical benefits. But venturing deep into space with probes, well, that offers the thrill of exploring other worlds. What we've learned in our tour of the solar system coming up. It's space. Why go there on Big Picture Science? live in a special time. It may seem pat, but think about it. For 300,000 years, our homo sapien ancestors could look up at the night sky. They saw a bunch of things that were not just mysterious, they were untouchable. Space was about as accessible as the bottom of the Marianas Trench to those folks. Not that they knew what the Marianas Trench was. But all that began to change when I was a kid. We went to the moon, yes, but we also did something else. We made the first ever, the first ever, close-up photos of the planets. We finally saw their faces, and many of those stunning images were the result of what started out as a grand tour. In the 1960s and 70s, NASA conceived and launched several missions to explore the outer solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and their moons that up to that time were not much more than fuzzy blobs in our telescopes, And it seemed that nature had been kind, lining up these worlds in a way that would allow us to visit them all without a large number of spacecraft. We learn more than we ever knew about their physical properties. You know, NASA's really invented the discipline of planetary science, and it's because we can go there and we can look at the geology, the atmosphere, measure a magnetosphere that's not ours. Jim Green is the director of NASA's Planetary Science Division. You know, when I grew up, everything we knew about the solar system, we got from the back end of the telescope, and now we've been there. But our telescopes also have been getting better. And as we got into the 90s, we then started to see objects that are orbiting our sun in our solar system 
that are beyond the orbit of Pluto. We call that the Kuiper Belt. We've discovered a new region of our solar system in our lifetime. Now, a lot of this new knowledge, really, derives from an idea that was cooked up in the 1960s, the so-called Grand Tour. Sounds like something from the Victorian era, but I think only the name. What was the idea, and just how grand was this Grand Tour going to be? Well, this was a fabulous idea by uh, several engineers and orbit dynamicists that recognized that a key planetary alignment, which happens every 170 or 80 years, something like that, was such that you could launch a spacecraft, get a gravity-assisted Jupiter, get a gravity-assisted Saturn, go by Uranus and Neptune, and even knock off Pluto. Pretty spectacular. That was called the Grand Tour. I mean, one, one craft could do One that. spacecraft, yeah. So this Grand Tour, it was cooked up in the 1960s, right? Right, was... about the mid-60s. And then and actually James Van Allen was one of the really big proponents of that, really tried to move that pretty hard. And we just couldn't get our act together. In fact, the National Academy, I believe at the time, said, uh, well, there are other priorities, other interests, and maybe that's not as important as these. That kind of derailed the momentum, and so we lost it. But... Many of the scientists, particularly after Pioneer 10 and 11 visited Jupiter and then um, 11, I believe, visited Saturn, uh, said, okay, let's, let's try to now go back to Jupiter and Saturn with flybys and really do a much more thorough job. That's where the Voyagers were created, you know, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Actually, when they first were put together, they were called Mariners. But one of them, if you launched it just at the right time, could pick up two more of the planets, and that would be Uranus and Neptune. But we couldn't get Pluto. Okay, but but you got eight of the nine. Yeah, we did. Knocked and, them off. And, in fact, just wait a little while, and it was eight of the eight, I suppose. Okay, so I think it's safe to say that the Pioneer and Voyager probes changed our view of the solar system radically. That was in the 1970s. Now, I mean, Copernicus changed our view of the solar system, too, but the probes certainly had better pictures. Give it that. Everything was different, right? I mean, oh, yeah. The textbooks changed overnight kind of thing. Yeah, it really did. My goodness. Okay, so, you know, I kind of liken this to what happened in the first few decades, if you will, of the 16th century, the great age of exploration when most of the blank areas of the globe were kind of filled in, right? Right. Within a generation, <laughs> the broad outlines of the continents, they were there. They were there. Now, haven't we done something similar for the solar system? Would you dare to say that the broad brush strokes have been laid down. I mean, in the last half century, we've done that. Yeah, I think we have. I mean, now with the really uh, capping off the fabulous uh, flyby of Pluto with, by New Horizons, and now New Horizons moving out into the Kuiper Belt, we're going to fly by a couple more Kuiper Belt objects. You know, there are probably maybe as many as three that are in what we now think is MU69, but we're going to get some more observations of those objects. That's really the initial survey of the solar system. We will have completed it. So... What's next? I mean, what does the next generation do? You know, the people listening to this, this broadcast, they're, they're, they're not all from the last generation. And, and the planetary alignment that prompted the Grand Tour, or at least the idea of the Grand Tour, you know, that, that's not going to happen again for a very long time. So what's the plan, Stan? All right. Well, you know, it's like Gone with the Wind, and we just read the first chapter. And there's so many more things that are going to be discovered as we go back and look at these planets in much more detail. Well, give me some ideas. I mean, well, you know, we have a methodology. You know, if you step back and you look at all the missions, we actually can categorize them in this manner. Fly by. That's our first set of missions. That gives us an idea. Hey, this is neat. We need to go back and we need to do these things. That, that's now, the easiest mission, is it? Easiest mission, fly by. The next complication is orbit. So go back to a particular planet or, or set of moons that you want to fly by and get that spacecraft in orbit that can do that science. That's important. And then land, particularly on bodies that are really spectacular, that will really tell us a lot after we learn from the orbiter what we need to do. And then bring back samples. Fly by, orbit, land, rove, sample return. So those are the categories of things you can do. But I suppose we'll do lots and lots of different objects. Maybe that is passe. You know, if it's Tuesday, this must be Saturn kind of, 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 a, of an experiment. Or, you know, will we pick out the most interesting places to go, for example, one of the moons of Saturn or Jupiter, where we think, okay, there might be some biology down there, and just spend all the money on that one 
object? Is that the way it's well, going to go? Well, uh, fortunately, you know, the American people have been really generous within their support of NASA that allow us to do several things simultaneously. You know, we have quite a few missions uh, currently at Mars. We have two fabulous rovers making uh, spectacular measurements. The one we're building now is another rover, and it's designed to go back to Mars in a really spectacular place. And we, we now know where to go and be able to core, in other words, drill rock, put them in sleeves of metal, and we're going to return those and analyze those in our laboratory. Pretty spectacular. Well, I mean, you haven't said it, but is the idea here to find remains of life? So, indeed, the first thing we want to do is pick a site for which we believe could have been habitable in Mars's past. And then, of course, the rock record tells us what happened to that environment. Uh, we believe that plenty of good evidence that Mars had in a significant ocean in its past. It went through rapid climate change, lost most of its ocean. Its water now is trapped in ices or in aquifers. And then um, we want to know how that happened. We want to know what was that uh, climate change all about. And that's all in the rock record. All right. So what about human involvement? I mean, lots of people like to point to the fact that sending uh, robots to do the exploring is better because they don't insist on a round-trip ticket and they don't need food or air or water or, you know, coffee or any of that stuff. But then again... Uh, exploration by remote control kind of lacks something. I think it lacks that human involvement. How, how do you stand on that? Are we going to see more of that? Well, indeed, uh, you know, human exploration is not Star Trek, okay? It's not go where no human has gone before. We don't do that, okay? We want to learn everything we can before we send humans. You know, we actually had quite a an extensive program that looked at the moon, looked at the sun in addition to the environment in and around the moon before we launched Apollo to put humans down on the moon. And that served us well because every one of those missions were tremendously successful at really exciting sites, bringing back rock material that we're still analyzing today. And so humans will play a very important role, but it's only after the planetary scientists who are the pioneers in this do the scouting. So send in the robots and then send in the folks. Yeah, bring in the, yeah. Bring in the people. <laughs> people later. But even now we know that, you know, as humans, we have a horizon goal, we call it, to go to Mars. Mars is a beautiful planet that has an atmosphere that has the most Earth-like terrestrial body and the set of terrestrial bodies that we can get to. We will learn an enormous amount more with humans involved in the scientific experiment, and they'll have their own rovers. Okay, Jim, but when school kids tell you that they want to go to Mars, and in my experience, they all want to go to Mars. I wanted to go to Mars. Yeah, right. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but, but what do you tell them? Do you tell them uh, well, better to study accounting? What do you tell them? Oh, no, no, absolutely not. You tell them what you know. You get them excited because if you can do that, then they will understand how to move in those directions, leveraging what we have learned so far. It's just that next generation, and they're there. They want to do it. Let's let them do it. The solar system is ours. Let's take it. And what about your own dream to go to Mars? Still holding out for that? Well, I, I would dearly love to see humans on Mars in my lifetime, and uh, I believe we have the ability to do that. Uh, we just have to make sure we stay the course, and with the will of the people and the support of NASA, we'll be able to pull that off. Jim Green, thanks so very much for speaking with us. My pleasure. Jim Green is NASA Planetary Science Division Director. Let me ask you, Seth, about what some of the science goals might be for NASA. He pointed us forward in a number of ways. The trip of New Horizons to the Kuiper Belt. Uh, the other is looking for life on Mars. And the other is uh, specific missions to the outer moons of the solar system. So let's start with one of those. Well, I think for me personally, 
I think the moons of the outer solar system would uh, rate number one for me simply because I'm interested in life in space. I don't think I'm alone in that. I think a lot of the public is interested in life in space. Okay, which moons, and how would you prioritize them? Well, the uh, the three big candidates, maybe it's four. Maybe I should say four. No, three. Europa, that's a moon of Jupiter. It uh, looks like a cracked ice ball because it seems to be a cracked ice ball. But there's a lot of water there. There's more water there than there is on Earth. It's just under all this ice. And uh, the beautiful thing here is that, you know, the ice does have cracks and some of what's below that liquid water actually gets squirted up. And that makes it a little easier maybe to, to search for life that's, you know, below 10 miles of frozen <laughs> tundra there. And, of uh, course, where there's water, there might be life. So yes. it's the NASA mantra, follow the water. That's what they say, right. But, but th this water might not be so hard to follow. In the old days, we thought you'd have to drill through it, but maybe, maybe you don't have to do that. The same is true on Saturn's moon Enceladus, which also has an under-ice <laughs> ocean. And occasional geysers, too. Right. Again, those geysers are great things because that means you don't have to land on the moon. You don't have to drill through the ice. You don't have to have a flashlight that gets dropped through the ice so you can see whatever's down there. You just grab some of the stuff being spewed out from underground there and, and maybe bring that back to Earth and take a look at that. Well, you say that, but that's a return mission. It's not easy. When you say you just grab some of that stuff and bring it back to Earth. Well, you don't have to land. I mean, that, that makes it a lot easier. <laughs> well, you still have to get out there. Oh, yes, you have to get out there. But we know how to get out there. We can get out there. Okay. I mean, NASA's really good at trajectories of their rockets. I mean, they really go right where they want them to go. So, you know, you just swing around one of those moons, either Europa or Enceladus, and, you know, you just have a big bucket, as it were, and grab some of that stuff being spewed out and uh, either analyze it on board, and then you don't have to come back to Earth, or you bring it back to Earth and, you, you know, you throw it down to the ground and have people look at it. Was there one more moon? Yeah, there is. Titan. Titan. Uh, Titan isn't in the news very much these days anymore, but it's uh, it's really a fascinating place because it has these liquids of methane and ethane on its surface. So you'd have to be one hardy mm -hmm. microbe to be living in that methane lake? Yeah, methane, ethane, that's right. That's right. That <laughs> methane, ethane lake? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd have to be a kind of microbe such as we probably don't have here. I mean, it's very cold. That stuff is really cold. But on the other hand, it's liquid. There's a little bit of sunlight that gets through the clouds and... You know, uh, it could very well be that there's some sort of very slow but <laughs> persistent biochemistry down there, and there's something is living in that gook. I don't so know. those are really microbes that are running on gas. That's right. They are. They well, are. fuel. Yeah, that's right. I, actually, <laughs> it even rains, you know, <laughs> liquid natural gas on Titan. That, that's something to see, uh, and it would be something where you wouldn't want to light up a cigarette, I suppose, except that there's no oxygen there, so it's okay. You could light up your cigarette. What about Mars? Yeah. What about Mars? Mars is not a moon. It's a planet. Are we still interested in looking for life on Mars? Well, Mars continues to be uh, the number one choice of maybe 50% of all the astrobiologists in the world as to where to send the next mission, because for Decades now, we've been sending things to Mars. You know about it, curiosity, spirit, opportunity, all these things, and orbiters. And the ultimate goal here, I think, largely, is to find Martian life. But none of those missions have really been looking for life, not, not recently. And there is some pressure to say, okay, you know, it's fine to figure out where the water was and so forth, but maybe we ought to take a gamble and actually look for life directly and immediately. And, and what would that entail? Digging under the surface of Mars? Yeah. On the surface, you don't expect... Well, you might find stuff on the surface that was alive and isn't alive now. To live on the surface now is very difficult because of the ultraviolet from the sun. But you might be able to, yeah, either dig into Mars or maybe just sift through the surface rock and, and see if you can find any remains of life that may have existed there some time ago. But would you go to where the ice is on Mars to look for life? Is it still... Is, is the idea still that you're following the water, or at least following the ice? Yeah, well, now you're sounding like, uh, you know, the NASA scientists sound like. They're, they're, they're trying to decide, where do you look? I mean, that is a big question, and that's one of the questions that the Curiosity rover is trying to answer, right? I mean, if you know where to look, you know, that makes finding the buried treasure chest a lot easier if you know where to dig before you start digging. You look for the great big X. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe there's a big X on Mars. But, you know, the other point of view is to say, well, let's take a chance because if we score, it's going to be so interesting. And finally, the most exciting thing we might learn about the Kuiper Belt when New Horizons enters it. Well, who knows? The most exciting thing we might learn are the things we can't even foresee learning. That's always the case. <laughs> okay, well done. A lot done. of ice out there. Though. All right, well, so what we're finding out is there are many reasons to go into space from 
those missions that are inspirational because they satisfy our need to explore. But if that's not your cup of tea, then there are practical reasons to go into space. Yes, indeed. I mean, think when people think of space, they think of astronauts playing golf on the moon. But really, the big thing in space, I mean, from the commercial point of view and, and also from the science point of view, uh, are the things we do with the satellites that orbit the Earth. I mean, GPS, international phone calls, international television, direct broadcast satellite and radio, the weather. We talked about the weather here. Military surveillance. That's important if you're in the military. Just mapping. I mean, all that stuff. Well, thanks to the team that is never very spacey, senior producer Gary Niederhoff, operations manager Barbara Vance, and intern Anna Katrina Hunter. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the behavior of rings around planets. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called Space, Why Go There? If you want to hear more Big Picture Science, well, go to our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because your Wi-Fi is sketchy in orbit, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. <laughs>